Well, I just want to welcome everybody today. If I've not got a chance to meet you yet, my name is Kyle Brownlee, and I have the awesome privilege of uh, serving as the lead pastor here at this incredible move of God that we call Experience Church. And also want to take a moment to look into the camera and welcome all those who are joining us for church online, uh, along with all the men and women joining us at the Correction Center of Northwest Ohio. We love you. We honor you. We're so glad you're a part of our church. Come on, D-Town. Help me welcome our church family today. So good. So good. Well, today we are starting a brand new four-week series on prayer called Ask. And I'm excited about this series because really the secret sauce to experiencing the abundant life that God has for each and every one of us is found in prayer. And before we kind of jump into the message today, I do want to encourage you, if there's something that you're believing God for, if there's something that you're asking God to do in your life, if there's something that you're praying about, man, we as your church family want to stand with you and storm heaven on your behalf. And so I want to encourage you to, to fill out a, a prayer card. If you're joining us here in person, it's in the seat back that's in front of you. You could take some time during the service and fill that out and then drop it in one of the giving stations on your way out today. If you're joining us online, we're going to put a link for a digital prayer card in the comment section. And you can also uh, fill out a, a, a prayer card through the Experience Church app uh, in, in the Connections section. And speaking of the Church app, uh, if you haven't downloaded it yet, you need to because uh, there's a great resource on there. There's many things you can do, but one of the things you can do is take sermon notes each and every week, all the points, all the scriptures, and then you can even, there's places for you to write down things God speaks to you right now in this moment, and then you can save those notes and go back and look at them later on in the week and months and years from now. I remember when God reminded me of his goodness. I remember when God reminded me of his faithfulness. I remember that sermon. I remember that point. And so I just want to encourage you to utilize that tool and that resource and then I want to invite you also every Wednesday for a midweek prayer. We gather together right here in this auditorium, and we pray from noon to one, and we pray all, uh, over all of those prayer cards. We pray over all those requests. We pray for our community. We pray for our schools. We pray for our nation. Come on, how many know there's power in prayer? Here's what I know about prayer, that there's some things in our lives that aren't going to change unless we pray. And so as we talk about prayer today and, and in the weeks ahead, let me give us just a, a simple definition of the word prayer, and that is talking with God. In other words, it's a conversation. Now, I know that might be weird for some of us, talking to somebody you can't see, talking to someone you're not sure if he's even there, if he's even listening, and then how, how does God talk back to us? Is this some audible voice that we hear, and it can kind of seem weird, the whole concept of prayer. But then for others of us, it might, it might seem kind of foreign. Not necessarily the idea of prayer seeming foreign, but the power and the reality of it in our lives. And so here's my heart uh, for us today and really throughout this entire series is that we would experience the power of prayer to the point that it would become a priority in our lives. Something we love to do. Something that we long to do. Because here's what I know. Prayer is our connection to God. How many of us have a, a smartphone? Come on, you can talk back to me. How many of us have a smartphone? A lot of us, if you still have a flip phone, we're praying for you after service. <laughs> Welcome to 2020. But if you have a smartphone, it's incredible what these things can do. Like they're, they're little mini computers, aren't they? Like we can email, we can send text messages, we can jump on different social media platforms. Man, we can take high quality pictures and videos. We can watch movies on these things. We can watch live TV on these devices, oh yeah, and by the way, we can also make phone calls. But no matter how much we can do with this phone, when it's not consistently connected to a power source, it's worthless. 
When, when this phone has power, man, we can talk to people all over the world. In fact, just this past week, me and uh, Justina, uh, my wife Justina, were, were FaceTiming our friends, Pastor Derek and Valentin Pitts, in the country of Belize. Shout out Belize. They watch every week. We love you guys. What God's doing in your country. We stand with you guys. Man, we were, just talk, we were laughing with them, praying for, for them, encouraging them. They were doing the same for us. It was incredible. All through a phone. We were texting back and forth with our friend Doobie Sabo, who lives in Israel. In Jerusalem, I was texting back and forth with Pastor Lucas, who lives in Australia, all this past week. The amazing things that we can do with these devices. But when it's not plugged into a power source, if it's not consistently connected to the power source, all the things I want to do with it are useless. Can I tell us today that our lives are a lot like these cell phones? That if we're not daily plugging into and connecting to our power source, the things that we try to do in our lives every single day become useless. The problem, maybe if you're anything like me, that sometimes we can fall into is when it comes to prayer, we only pray about things that we need. We only pray when we need something. We don't necessarily have a routine we don't necessarily have a, a daily discipline of prayer. And so what happens a lot of times when, when God doesn't answer our prayer how we want, when we want, all of a sudden prayer becomes a last resort instead of a first response. Let me try everything else first. Oh, yeah, and when I'm all out of options, I'll pray. Let me ask us a question. How, how often do we charge our cell phones? Every day, right? Every single day. I got this little pad next to my bed that I can just lay it on. That's how lazy I get. I don't even have to plug the thing in anymore. I can just lay it on this little charging pad, and it charges all night long. Because I know, and we know we have to charge this thing every day. Because if we don't, they can't make it through the day, and we aren't going to be able to do everything that we want to do. Right? Here's my point, if you haven't picked it up yet. Our lives, our connection, and how we plug into the source, the creator of the universe, is found through prayer. Here's my heart for us today, and really throughout this series, is that we would understand and, and approach prayer in such a way that we would experience the power of it in our lives. Because prayer changes things. Prayer makes a difference. Prayer moves mountains. Prayer is the avenue for heaven to invade earth. Prayer changes things in our lives. I'm not talking about praying prayers like, oh, God, if you think you can, if you get around to it, God, maybe, maybe you could help me, God. Maybe if, I know you're helping everybody else, God, but not me. But maybe if this one time I'll pray. That's not what I'm talking about, praying like that. I'm talking about praying prayers that move mountains. I'm talking about praying prayers that change my situation. That I might be facing something that's chaotic and confusing, but as I open my mouth and I start praying to the creator of the universe, this peace that transcends all understanding guards my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. And all of a sudden I have a peace and a godly perspective of knowing what God wants me to do and how he wants me to respond to my situation. And so today... I want to talk to us, the title of my message is how to pray and get results. How to pray and get results. We all want results, don't we? Like if I'm going to go on a diet and eat kale chips and spinach, I need to know I'm going to see some results, right? If I'm going to start working out and trying to survive on the belt of death, also known as a treadmill, I want to know I'm going to get some results for doing this, Right? If I'm going to put all those, come on, students, I'm going to put all those hours into studying for that test, I want to get that thing back and see some results. I want to see the A on that paper. If I'm going to put all that effort and energy into my job, into my career, I want to see some results when it comes payday. And I get that pay, I want to see some results. What if I told you today that's exactly how Jesus told us to pray? that we would pray in such a way that we would get results. Let's take a look at it in Scripture. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 7. 
when it comes to prayer, Jesus said, ask. Everybody say ask. Ask Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Jesus first tells us to ask. In other words, prayer requires us to humble ourselves. Has anyone else besides me found them themselves in moments where we had a hard time asking for help? Anybody else? It's humbling, isn't it? Having to admit I don't have the answers, not being able to accomplish something I wanted to do, not being able to figure something out, and then I'm having to ask somebody else for help because I can't do it on my own. It's humbling, isn't it? But then I was thinking about some of the struggles in my own life, and I thought, you know, uh, not only do I struggle sometimes with asking for help, but then I can struggle with admitting that I need it in the first place. Anybody else? You know, growing up as a kid back in the 80s, we used to take a family vacation like one time a year. And back then, you drove everywhere. You didn't fly. You loaded up the car, and you drove 55 miles an hour down the interstate. Right? In fact, that was part of your vacation. Your parents told you, part of the vacation is just getting there and making it alive. Like, enjoy the scenery. And so I remember taking these trips, and we didn't have GPS back then. And so my dad had this, like, massive atlas with all the, it was like two foot by three foot. Like, it was this huge booklet of all 50 states and all the roads in each state. And he used it to navigate and get us where we wanted to go. And for the most part, he did a really good job. But every once in a while... My dad would get lost, and everybody in the car, everybody in the family knew my dad has no idea where he's going. The problem was he would never stop and ask anybody for help. He never stopped and asked for directions, and if anybody in the family would ask him, Dad, are you lost? He would make them, no, 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 no. I wanted to take this, this route, this scenic view. How, look how beautiful. He'd point out something, some random thing on the side of the road. Look, look at that dead dog. Isn't that cool? I wanted to see that. He he would never admit that he was lost and he didn't know where he was going. I wonder how many of us are living our lives like that today. Not only won't we ask for help, but we won't even admit that we need it in the first place. You see, prayer, uh, praying prayers that get results require humility. Humility is when we live with the understanding and the reality that apart from him, I can do nothing. Like apart from God, I can't make it. Apart from him, I can do, I need him. I'm desperate for him. That's a humility that we have to live with. That's asking that Jesus is telling us in Matthew chapter seven. The word humility literally means to be low, to place ourselves under, to bring ourselves into subjection, to to place ourselves under God's authority. And when it comes to prayer, sometimes I think we can have a, a wrong idea about prayer. Like, like there was a time when I used to think you had, to, if you're going to pray effective prayers, then you have to like be praying for hours on end. Anybody ever thought like that? Like, man, just prayer, I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to, to pray for hours on end. I'm busy. i got a lot going on. If you've ever felt like that, I'm comforted by the, the uh, evangelist, the well-known evangelist, Smith Wigglesworth, uh, his words. I put it in your notes. He said this about prayer. He said, I never pray more than 20 minutes, but I never go 20 minutes without praying. In in other words, we don't have to pray for hours on end, but we do need a humility to know I can't go very long without plugging into the source. I can't go too long without connecting my heart to the king. I can't go too long because apart from him, I can do nothing. Jesus said, ask and you will receive. And then he said, seek and you will find. Notice Jesus didn't say, look. He said, seek, right? For example, if we lost our our wallet or ladies, you lost your purse with all of our, our debit cards, credit cards, all of our money, all of our driver's license, identification, ladies, all those other things that you keep in your purse. The other day, my wife said, can you hold my purse? She handed me a mini suitcase. It's like, a, it's like a carry-on. I'm like, honey, this is not a purse. This is a suitcase. Where are you going? What do you, what do you have in here? And she's like, don't make fun. 
Because you, you're going to need something. I guarantee you it's in that purse. Next time the kids are crying, there's some candy at the bottom of that thing that's been there for months and years on it. I just dig it in, throw it in the back seat, shut them up. Don't complain now. There's a lot of stuff. i got a first aid kid. If you cut your finger off, I can repair it and put it back together. There's so much going on in this purse. I just held that thing, did some curls with it. Did a little workout. Honey, can I borrow your suitcase for a little bit? But if we lost our wallet, if we lost some things that are valuable to us, we wouldn't just stand there and look around and go, ah, I don't see it. Right? No, I'm getting on my hands and knees. I'm tearing the couch apart. I'm looking under things. And I'm not going anywhere until I find that thing. That's how Jesus said to pray. He said, pray with a passion. Not like, well, I tried. I prayed once. God didn't do anything. No, no, no. To pray with a passion that we would pray until something happens. That I'm not going anywhere until you bless me. Doesn't that kind of remind you of, of when Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament? Like he wrestled, and, then, and as the sun came up, as daybreak came, the angel of the Lord looks at, at Jacob after wrestling all night and says, let me go. The sun's coming up, and Jacob says, I will not let you go until you bless me. I'm, I'm going to pray until you move. I'm going to pray until something's different in my life. I'm not going anywhere until my situation changes. I'm not going anywhere until God does something. I'm praying until something happens. God says, Jesus said, pray like that. Pray with a passion like that. And if you've ever prayed like that, you, you know that God oftentimes does something in us before he does something in our situation. He does something in me. Wait a minute, my situation didn't even need to change. Something needed to change in me. I had a doubt. I had a depression. I had a fear. I had an anxiety. I had something in me, and God unlocked it. He broke it, and he set me. He did something in me before he did something for me. Jesus said, ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Then he said, knock and the door will be opened. I think it's interesting that one of the disciples, Luke, uh, in his book of the Bible, gives us some different details about this, this time when Jesus is teaching them about prayer. I want us to take a look at it. It's found in Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 9. It says, then Jesus, teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. He said, suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. And you say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, and I've got nothing, for, nothing to, uh, for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me, the door's locked for the night. My family and I are all in bed. I, I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he, he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. I get, the, I, I, I get the picture that this friend at one point in time, this is my own theory, but this friend at one point in time said, if you ever need anything, just come on over. It doesn't even matter that if it's in the middle of the night, if you ever need anything, just come over and knock and ask. And because of your shameless persistence, he's going to get up and answer the door. Verse 9 says, and so I tell you, keep on asking. Who needs to hear that today? Keep on asking, and you will receive whatever you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. Jesus tells us that if we want to pray in a way that gets results, to ask, seek, knock. And as we do, he gives us this incredible promise that we'll receive, that we'll find, and then opportunities and doors that were once shut in our life will be opened. Man, what if, what if we prayed like that every day? What if we prayed those kind of prayers to, to communicate with God daily by asking with this humility, God, I need you. By, by seeking with this, this passion, I'm not going anywhere until you move in my life. To pray with, by, by knocking with this persistence and this perseverance. Let me tell you, if we pray like that on a consistent daily basis, all of a sudden we're not just praying to get something, we're praying to encounter someone. And when we pray to encounter someone, those are the kind of prayers that get results. Those are the kind of prayers that change situations. And speaking of results, I think it's important for us to understand that why we pray determines what kind of results we see. 
How many of us have ever heard that phrase, you have not because you ask not? not. Did you know that that's a scripture in the Bible? James talks about it in in James chapter 4. Let's take a look at it. Verse 2, James tells us, you do not have because you do not ask God. You have not because you ask not. Verse 3 says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. You ask with the wrong heart. You ask that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures, on yourself. You have selfish motives. It's all about you. When you pray, it's not about me. It's about you. You just came to get something from me. You didn't come to encounter someone. You didn't come to spend time with anyone. You came to get something from God. Like he's some genie. And if we pray just right and rub the side, we get three wishes. Like, like that's what I came. I came to get something. And James is telling us, no, you ask with wrong motives. That Why you pray determines what kind of results you get and how long they last in your life. And so if we want to pray in a way that gets results, the right results, results that last, James tells us that why we pray matters. And so let me give us these three reasons why we pray. If you're taking notes today, the first reason we pray is, number one, is to invite God in. In other words, God's not going to invade our lives. He wants to be invited in into our lives. The Bible says it like this in Revelation chapter three. Jesus speaking here and he says, look, I stand at the door and knock. Wow, I love this. Because not only did Jesus tell us to knock at the door of prayer, but how many of us know that Jesus is doing some knocking of his own? He's knocking at a door, the door of our hearts. He says, if you hear my voice and you open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Man, we'll have this communication, this intimacy, this relationship that's close. You see, God doesn't beat the door down of our hearts and force his way into our lives. He simply knocks and he patiently waits for us to open up and invite him in. Man, God stands at the door of our hearts every single day. He just knocks. Hey, it's me, Jesus. Can I I come in? Can I help you put some things back in order? It's me, Jesus. Hey, I heard you just needed some help. Just wanted to come in and help clean some things up. What's that? You're busy? You just, just started that new relationship? Got that new boyfriend? Got that new girlfriend? You're busy with that? Are you busy at the lake today? I, I get it. Oh, you're chasing that career. You, you got a lot going on, handle a lot of different things. You're you know, just a lot of stress at work. I got a lot going on. That's okay. I'll, I'll come back tomorrow. I'll come back tomorrow. And the next day he comes back and knocks. And, hey, it's me, Jesus. It's me, Jesus. Hey, I, I heard you're going through some things today. I, I heard you're struggling. I heard, I heard you're discouraged today. I heard you're dealing with some depression. I heard you feel kind of lonely. I heard, I heard your marriage isn't all that you tell people that it is. I heard that addiction has come back and it's wreaking havoc in your life. I heard you've, you got, got a little hopeless. It's me, Jesus. Can, can I come in? Can I come in today? Can I come into the, 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 the door of your heart? Can I come into your life? And we might think, well, it's, my house is a mess. I wasn't planning on anybody coming over today. I didn't, I didn't pick anything up. I didn't clean anything up. And Jesus would say, that's okay. That's what I do. I clean up messes. You see, I'm a carpenter. I rebuild things. I rebuild lives. In fact, I got a whole cleaning crew here with me called the Holy Spirit. And if you'll let us in, we can do a work in your lives. We can do a work in your marriage. We can do a work in your mind. We can do a work with that addiction. If you'll just open up and... Invite us in. Every day, God stands at the door of our heart and he knocks. And when we pray, we're inviting him into our daily lives. God, I need you. I need you in this situation. I need you here. I need you there. I need you. I'm inviting you in. You see, I think so many of us make the mistake that we we invite God in to forgive us of our sin but then that becomes the first and last time we invite God into our daily lives. I'm gonna invite God in for salvation. 
but I don't invite him in daily to my, to my marriage. I don't invite him daily into my parenting. I don't invite him daily into the pressures that I'm feeling at school. I don't invite him daily into things that I'm dealing with and that I'm, I'm up against. And so what do we do? We, we go through life without plugging into the source. Day in and day out, we go through life facing all these situations, all these circumstances, without connecting our hearts to the king. How many know God wants to be our GPS? He wants to give us turn-by-turn turn instructions for our lives. The reality is too many of us are asking Siri for help and not our Savior, Jesus. Siri, how do I get here? Siri, what, can you answer this question for me? Siri, can you remind me of this? How about we ask Jesus where he wants us to go and how he wants us to get here? How about we ask Jesus some of the questions that are in our hearts? How about we ask the Holy Spirit to remind us that apart from him, we can do nothing and I gotta daily plug in and connect to the power source because I can't do it without him. All right, I'm fired up a little bit today. So the first reason we pray is to invite God in. Second reason we pray, number two, if you're taking notes, write this down, and that is to hear God's voice. You see, prayer becomes powerful not only when we talk to God, but when he talks to us. I'm gonna say it like this, prayer becomes even more powerful when I hear his voice. I remember several years ago praying and asking God what his will was for my life. Anybody ever ask God, God, what do you want me to do? I'd just gotten saved. God had done just a, a miraculous work in my heart, delivered me from so many things. And I just had this heart man, and this desire and this passion. God, I want to help other people encounter your love like I did. I want other people to experience your freedom and your joy and your victory like what you did in my life, God. And so I was just praying, God, what do you want me to do? And I was feeling stirred to do one of two things. You see, I was feeling stirred to go in, uh, intern at a church in Kansas City, Kansas. But then I was also feeling stirred to go back to the same drug and alcohol, Christian drug and alcohol rehab, where God changed my life in South Dakota. And I was living in Omaha, Nebraska at the time. And so I'm praying, God, I just want to know that I know that I know what your will is and what your plan is, and I'll go do it. Just tell me. And how many of us know sometimes God answers our prayers in a moment, in a minute, and then other times it's a month. <laughs> other times it takes a little while. But I just, I've been praying about it for a couple weeks. And, and I was a few months before I was leaving Omaha, about three months until I was leaving Omaha. And so I was just praying, God, what do you want me to do? Where, where do you want me to go when I'm done here in, in Omaha, Nebraska? And one day I'm meeting with my mentor. And out of the blue, out of the blue, he said, hey, I talked to the director of the Christian Drug and Alcohol Treatment Facility in South Dakota, and I just told him, I thought you'd make a great staff member. And my eyes got super big because I hadn't told my mentor what I was praying about. I still had like three months until I had to make the decision, so I was just praying about it, me and God, something I was stirring with. I was eventually going to tell him, but I just hadn't gotten around to it yet. So I don't know, he had no idea I was praying about it. So I'm thinking to myself, man, this is it. This is it. And so I'll go, I'll call him, but, so I'm getting ready to call the director of the, of the program, but I'm still feeling stirred to go to this internship in Kansas City, and I can't shake it, but, but I feel stirred to go work in South Dakota at this, at this Christian drug and alcohol rehab. So I called the director in South Dakota. I said, hey, I was just talking to my mentor. He shared with me some things that he told you that, that he thought that I'd make a great st staff member, and honestly, I feel like God's calling me into ministry. He's calling me to become a staff member. And the director on the phone says, well, if that's the case, then I want you to go to this internship in Kansas City, Kansas at this. I about threw the phone down and just ran somewhere. You know what I mean? Like I about jumped out of my skin. Cause he had no, he, 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 he had no idea. But God knew. And in that moment, his voice was so loud, so loud. I've been praying about this. That's what I've been asking. God, I just want to know that I know that I know. God, I just want to hear your voice and know this is you. And all of a sudden, in, in two conversations within a week, I'm going, thank you, God, because I heard your voice. And then, I, and then that night, I got down on my knees, and I thank God that, that he allowed me to hear his voice in prayer. I, mean, I couldn't wait to pray next. Like, God, what are we going to do next? Right? 
there's, there's power in prayer. The, the struggle is, I think, for a lot of us is, is that we have, to, we have to wait for God to speak to us, right? Prayer is a dialogue. It's us talking to God, but it's also him talking to us. We pray to hear God's voice, but then we, we struggle because we have to wait to hear his voice. We have to listen. We got to get close enough to hear that, that gentle whisper of our father. And most of us, we just, we're busy. We're in a hurry when we pray. And so we do like this drive-by prayer. We just tell God everything that we need, everything that we want him to do. And by the time God gets ready to speak back to us, we're long gone. The Bible tells us in Psalm 46 that we have to be still and know that he's God. I gotta be still before my king so I can hear his voice. How many of us know that takes intentionality? We gotta have a plan. I gotta set aside time for these next 20 minutes. I'm gonna spend some time in prayer and I'm gonna use some of that time to talk to God, but then I'm also gonna take some of that time and I'm gonna be still before my father and I'm gonna let him talk to me. Jesus said, ask, seek, knock. This speaks to a, a hunger and thirst and this appetite that I gotta hear God's voice. It's been too long. I'm plugging into the source, not just to tell him. He already knows what I need. I gotta plug into the source. And I gotta listen to his voice. It's this, it's this appetite that I, I, apart from him, I can do nothing. I gotta get into his presence and hear his voice. It's this, this appetite, this hunger and thirst to hear the voice of our Father. How many of us get hungry every day? Everybody's like, yeah, this is kind of a dumb question, Pastor. You won't say it, though. How many of us are hungry now? Come on, that's the real question. We all do, right? Because our bodies need fuel. So do our spirits. So do our spirits. And some of us, the last time we ate spiritually was last week in church. And so we've gone a whole week, a whole seven days without any spiritual food. What would we look like physically if we hadn't put any food in our bodies for seven days? Some of us are like, well, actually, Pastor, that's exactly what I need to do. I need to lose some of this. But for others of us, we know that, that we would be malnourished if we lived our lives like that. The truth is, some of our physical bodies are in better conditions than our spirits. Because we're not spending any time with God, right? We only pray when we need something. We have this daily discipline, this daily routine. We look good on the outside, but we're spiritually dying on the inside. And that we would just connect with God on a daily basis through prayer. But here's what I know about devotion. Devotion doesn't always start off as devotion that oftentimes it starts out as a discipline. We do it not, not necessarily because we want to or even feel like doing it, but because we know we need to. It's a little bit like running for me. I don't run because I love it or I feel like, like doing it, but after I'm done, I love how I feel when I'm done and I love the results that I get. And what started out as a discipline turned into a desire, and the more I did it and the more results that I saw from it, it became a delight. Can I tell us the, the same thing when, when it comes to prayer? It may start out as a discipline, but the more we invite God in, the more we hear God's voice, the more it becomes a desire, and the more it becomes a delight. How many of us have ever sat down at a meal, and after we got done eating, we are like, I ate too much. I did this just two days ago. I was like, I ate way too much. There's so much food. Well, what happened? It tasted so good and was satisfying something on the inside of us that we couldn't stop eating. Can I tell us the same and even more is true with prayer? That the more we pray and the more we invite God in and the more we hear God's voice, the more we just can't seem to stop. And all of a sudden, God starts to satisfy what only he can satisfy on the inside of our hearts. I gotta have, I gotta have more of it. And we pray to invite God in. We, we pray to hear God's voice. And then finally today, number three. The reason why we pray is number three is because prayer is a weapon. Prayer is a weapon. 
Prayer is the thing that can go into situations and change things when I don't have the ability to change it. Some of us think, think of prayer more as a wish list, but I'm here to tell us today, prayer's a weapon. Let me show it to us in Scripture, Matthew chapter 18. Verse 18 says it like this. You know what's interesting about this Scripture? I wasn't going to teach on this, but I'm going to now because i got two minutes left, so I'm going to take ten of it. <laughs> but because it's for God, he gives me back the other eight. What's interesting about this scripture is that Jesus is basically teaching on the power of prayer. But if you read the verses before it, it's actually about restoring a brother who's in sin. Someone who sins against you. Someone who hurts you. Someone who wounds you. Someone who does you dirty. And the Bible tells us to, to, if they've done something against you, go to them and tell them. And if they don't listen to you, what does it say? Go back and bring somebody, get, bring a few people that are highly respected, that love this individual. Bring back and try to restore him gently. And if he doesn't listen... Take him before the church, right? And they don't, and he still doesn't listen. It says, Jesus is teaching, he says, treat him like a tax collector. Well, so many, so many Christians think, oh, tax collector, like he got, I'm writing him off, he gone, I'm done with him. Can I tell you what a tax collector is in the Bible? A t- someone who collected taxes for the government, right, for the Romans, was an Israelite, was a Jew, who collected taxes amongst his fellow Jews, and then he lied and schemed and overcharged his fellow Jewish people and Israelites so that he could get rich. And otherwise, it was a Jewish person, a Christian, if you will, who forgot who he was, who lost sight of his identity, had some blinders over his life, had some strongholds that needed torn down, wasn't living up to his purpose, had lost his identity, who had forgotten who he was. It was one of their own. Then Jesus comes to verse 18. And he says this, truly I tell you, we give up on people way too much. Jesus is saying, if that don't work, if that don't work, if that don't work, get on your face. Get on your face because I've given you authority in prayer. Prayer's a weapon. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He's talking about this guy that's like a tax collector. In other words, you have authority in prayer. To loose something means we allow it. To bind something means we disallow it. That we can pray in the name of Jesus, and all of heaven backs that up. We need to take out our weapon of prayer because we put it down for way too long. We've only been using prayer to get something from God, but God says, I've given you authority to loosen and bind some things in your life, to loosen and bind some things in your marriage, to loosen and bind some things in your family, to loosen and bind some things in your school, to loosen and bind some things in this community, in this nation, in this world. I've given you authority, prayer's a weapon. Verse 19, he says, again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. The next verse is where two or three are gathered. Jesus says, there I am in the midst. What's he talking about? A prayer that changes somebody else's life to rescue those who have fallen away, to have lost sight of who they are. God, they're bound, they're blind. God says, pray, where two or three are gathered. Jesus isn't saying, where two or three are gathered, you join hands and join your faith, and you can get that Ferrari. You right? You can get what you want. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, where two or three are gathered, because you care about what I care about, and I care about my kids, and I care about that person who's addicted, and I care about the marriage that's struggling, and I care about that person who's left the faith, and he's running. I care about that prodigal son. I care about that prodigal daughter. I care about that person who's, who's dealing with depression and hopelessness, and they feel all alone, and you care about what I care about, so when two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst, and truly I tell you, whatever you loose, 
And whatever you bind, it will be done. You have authority. It's power. It's power in prayer. And we, when we pray, we invite God in to our daily lives, every situation. We, we pray so I can hear God's voice because prayer is powerful when we talk to God, but man, prayer changes things when, when God starts talking to us. We pray because prayer is a weapon. Man, if we want to pray in such a way to get results, we don't pray every once in a while. We have a routine. We have a daily discipline, and it might start out as a discipline, but the more we do it, the more we experience the power of it, the more it becomes our desire, the more it becomes our delight, the more I've gone too long without plugging into the source. i got to connect to the King and experience His love, His grace, and His power in my life. Amen. Would you pray with me today? Father, we thank you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace and your goodness, God. Wow. Holy Spirit, right now in this time, we just want to take a moment and pray this prayer. Holy Spirit, how would you have us respond to the message? How would you have us respond to your truth? How would you have us respond? God, we don't want to just be hearers of your word. We want to be doers. We want to activate your word and your truth in our lives. As we're praying together today, maybe you're here and you would say, man, I want to pray. I want to pray with power. I want to pray with authority. I want to pray in such a way that gets results. And I know I need a daily discipline of prayer. I know I need to start praying and inviting God in into every situation. I want to pray in such a way to hear God's voice. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to use prayer as a weapon to tear down some strongholds, to loose and bind some things in my life, in my family. If that's you, you want to take your prayer life to another level and pray in a way that gets results, would you just lift your hand to heaven? I want to pray over you right now. Come on, I want to pray. I want to take my prayer game to another level. Father, I pray every hand would be up. My hand's up, God. God, I want to pray in such a way that gets results. I want to pray, God, I want to have a daily discipline of prayer where I'm inviting you into every situation because I need you, because apart from you, I can do nothing. God, I want to pray, God, in such a way that I can hear your voice. God, I pray that over us today, that as we're praying, man, we can hear your voice. God, give us eyes to see and ears to hear your voice. God, all I need is a word. All I need is a word, God. Just pray and let me hear your voice. God, the prayer is a weapon. God, help us. Help us just take that step. Help us, God, just the daily discipline of prayer. And I'll pray as we do, as we trust you because you're faithful, it would turn into a desire and eventually become a delight. As we continue praying together today, maybe you're here and a prayer you need to pray is say, God, here's my life. I realize apart from you, I can do nothing. I've been trying to live my life on my own. I've been trying to do things in my own strength. And I, I, I've known about you, but God, I'm ready to surrender my life to you, to give you control. That you would be the Lord and Savior of my heart, Lord and Savior of my life. And if you need to pray that prayer today, would you lift your hand to heaven and say, here I am, God. I want to know you. I want to encounter you. I want to experience a love that never fails. And right where you're at, would you just pray this prayer with me? Say, God, thank you. Thank you for running after me. Thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you, God, that you never gave up on me. Thank you, God, that you always believe in me. Nobody loves me like you do, God. Nobody stands beside me like you do, God. Nobody has given me as many chances as you've given me, God. Your love is relentless. Thank you, God, for your love that never fails. Thank you for the cross, the price Jesus paid for my sin on the cross. And today, here's my life. God, forgive me. 
Change me. Heal me. Restore me. Fill me, God, with your presence. Fill me with with your love. Fill me with your grace. Fill me with your power. My life is yours. In Jesus' name. And everybody said...